And as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, we read this passage from Luke chapter 2. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. When God does a new thing in your life, it's okay to be a little shook up from time to time. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Would you pray with me? Father God, we read your word today. We seek your face. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Father God, as we hear your word, as we reflect upon it, prepare in our hearts. If we don't have a word yet to maybe think of one, there's still time. As we lay down a word. For those of us who lay down our gift for those of us who receive communion today may this be a day about appreciating the past and anticipating the future thanking you God for all you've done and asking you to continue to work in our lives we love you we praise you we thank you in Jesus name we pray amen amen you may go ahead and get cozy you may go ahead and have a seat I gotta ask is anyone excited to be at church today is anyone feeling good it's so good to see you nine o'clock you look great we're honored you're here my name is Thomas Lane. Most of you call me T. Lane or Pastor T. A lot of you are new to this church or church in general. I want you to know you're welcome here. This can be your church, your home, your place. We want to grow together and learn together, and we're just thankful that you're here with us today. Let's welcome all our friends online, especially our military community. Would you give it up for them? They can hear you and see you. We love them. We're thankful for you. And now's the time if you haven't done so. If you use social media, let's connect. You can find us at Ascent Church VA. We're thankful when you check in, when you tag us and spread the word, especially with the Christmas season approaching. Let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Let's start back at verse 13. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared. That's an army, by the way, with the angel praising God and saying this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Nostalgic passage, beautiful passage. And if I can be very frank with you, it's hard to preach Christmas. You know why? Because you think you know it. Because you think, I've heard this my whole life. Even if you've never really been to church before, you probably could say, I know the Christmas story, or I could make it up. Okay, you've seen the nativity scene, you've seen the angels, you've seen the shepherds, you've seen the cute eight pound, six ounce little baby Jesus. <laughs> Gooey and adorable, just laying there, and it's like, ah, it's warm, it's nostalgic. But I want to try to teach you something new and help you learn something today to see Christmas maybe in a new light, maybe take us a little deeper so that God could take us higher. Because some of you think you know this, because you grew up in church. You grew up, you were in the handbell choir at your church. Okay, you might have stolen a bell or two on the way out. You might still have the robe somewhere stashed away in your closet. Some of you growing up, you were in the drive through nativity at your church. You were a donkey. You were a camel. You were something. You were in it, okay? Like, you're like, I, dude, I know this story. I know this. I do not want you zoning out. I want us to lean in, to, to really just lean in together. And we're going to start um, with the context of Christmas. It's this book in the Bible called Malachi. Somebody say Malachi. <laughs> Tell your neighbor it's not Malachi. <laughs> I heard someone say Malachi. Nope. Close. No, I'll give you credit, but it's not Malachi. If you have a Bible and you're looking through it, or if you have an app, nothing wrong with an app, you're looking through it, um, you, you get to the Old Testament crossing to the New, you see Malachi, one more time, not Malachi, and then it goes right to Matthew. And if you're reading through the Bible, you're like, Malachi, Matthew, it's great. It's just, you turn the page. Here we're in the New Testament. Here we are. Between Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, and Matthew was 400 years. Tell your neighbor, that's a long time. Now the nerds, the scholars call this the intertestamental period or the intertestamental period or the inter intertestamental era. They call it that. I call them nerds. Okay? The point is that for 400 years, there were no prophets. There was no scripture. There was a lot of silence. And if you think, well, okay, well, God was so active, wasn't he? Well, of course he was active. He, didn't, he wasn't gone. But you need to know God's people didn't, have an, didn't exactly have an easy go of it during that time. 
If you know biblical history, they were taken over. They were assaulted by the Assyrians. Then they were taken over by the Babylonians. Then they were taken over by the Greeks. Then they were taken over by, I'm sorry, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And through this 400 years, they're getting trampled and beat down. And they're exhausted and they're tired. And I can't help but think there was a time or two when they asked, where are you, God? Because Malachi ends by saying, I'm going to send the prophet. He's, he's going to be kind of like Elijah. Elijah's coming to prepare the way. That would get me pretty hyped. And God and the prophet says, he's coming himself. So for 400 years, God's people are like, where is he? Is he coming? And not only do they not see him coming, it's worse than ever. It's a time of darkness. It's a time God's people were trampled. It is 400 years of silence. Have you ever felt like your life is in 400 years of silence? Because some of you, if I can be honest with you, there's been a time or two in my life I feel like God is completely silent. I'm reading the Bible, and I just don't, I don't, sometimes you read it, and you feel like it's jumping out at you, and it's piercing you, and it's speaking to you, and sometimes I read it, and I don't feel anything. If I can be honest, I'm more excited about the coffee at quiet time than the Word of God, if I can be completely honest. Sometimes it's worship. You say, let's go to worship. I'm with God's people. We're in worship. It's a powerful moment. And the lyrics are hitting. And I know it's powerful. And I know who God is. But I still don't feel any stirring. I feel like he's silent. Whether it's a book or group, sometimes you are actively seeking him. And you can't help but feel like he is silent. Where is he? What I want you to see, the reason I'm telling you this, it was in this context That he did the greatest miracle he's ever done. Through 400 years of darkness and silence. At the right time. No, no, no. At the appointed time. He did the greatest act of love in the history of the universe. He sent his son. And it was in this context. And if that's how God operates. If that's who he is in your life. What if he isn't distant? What if he's waiting? Because some of you would have said, I don't even know why I'm at church. God's distant. He doesn't care about me. What if he isn't distant? What if he's waiting for the right time, for the opportune time? You see, God didn't slowly, you'd think he would kind of slowly ramp things up. Here's a prophet or two, and then some scripture or two, and then I'm coming. No, out of the blue, bam, he's here. God's an all-in kind of God. Some of you get in the pool. Who puts your toes in first and feels the water? What are you crazy cannonball people? That's God, full cannonball, boom, son, he's here. He's here. That's what he did. That's who he is. That's what he did, friends. He didn't abandon you. He's waiting for the right moment. He's waiting for the right moment. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Somebody say, let's go. Say it like you mean it, like this guy said. Say, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. Somebody say they hurried. Christmas time has always been a time of rushing, it appears. All right, rushing, cutting people off, paying extra for shipping. Okay, we're in a rush. It's been since day one, son. It's not just you. They hurried off. We got things to do. And they found Mary and Joseph in the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told us, had told them. Somebody once again say, let's go. Christmas calls us to action. The problem with Christmas is we've heard it so much, it doesn't stir you anymore. It's like it's almost nostalgic and quiet and cute and awe, but the shepherds didn't say, let's write a song and sing by the campfire. They said, let's go. People got to know about this. I got to see this. I got to experience it. They knew something that a lot of us have forgotten, that Christmas changes everything. Jesus, one time, he's talking to the disciples, and to paraphrase, he's basically saying, kings had longed to hear what you heard and to see what you've seen, and they didn't get the chance. These shepherds have the opportunity of a lifetime. The Son of God is here, and you have the same opportunity. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's go. Let's hurry. Let's, let's look at him. Let's gaze upon him. Let's figure out who he is. Let's, let's get to know him better. Let's tell people about this. This changes everything. The Alpha and the Omega is here. He's here among us. 
This changes everything. I know it's cute. I know it's cozy. I know you've got the, the lights and the ornaments, and you like to cozy by the tree and watch Elf at Home Alone. And I am mad at Kevin McAllister. I am mad at him. But what I'm saying is don't miss it. Don't miss it. You've got to say, let's go. This is the time, probably the best time of the whole year, um, to bring your friends to church or to tell them about what God's up to. There are some people who might not come to church if you ask them on a regular day, but with Christmas, they'll be like, yeah, I'll join you. They might hear the gospel for the first time. They may come and it change everything, and then they go to church. They give their life to Jesus. You never know what God could do. And I want you to know, I want you to know that, that um, you need to reserve a seat for Christmas. And this isn't to keep people out. It's to get as many people in as possible. Don't go around saying, my church has tickets. Or we're not Taylor Swift. <laughs> it's not tickets. We want to make sure there's room for you and your family. And if everyone came to one service, we couldn't fit everyone. We're doing four. Two of them are already over halfway full. Which is a good thing. It's a good thing, but I hope it lights a little bit of a fire. And you're like, I need to reserve a spot. It's free. Just go online, reserve a spot. And don't reserve like 30, and then the night before cancel them down to like four. Don't do that. Whoever's coming, whoever's joining you, just save them a spot. If they need a seat, save them a seat. If they're going to go in A-Kids, give, give them a spot in A-Kids. And some of you, I love you, but like you're, re you're like regulars. You're like, I go here. I got a parking spot. It's by the ABC store, but I got one. Okay. <laughs> I go here. It's my church. The donut lady knows me, first name basis. <laughs> I'll get a seat when I want to. Love you. Love you. Care about you. Get a seat now. Okay? Don't forget and then show up in a service that's full and kick this new cute little family out who's military and don't know anybody. Don't do that. Don't do that. Friends, at Ascent Church, we're people in action. And there's something about this time of year where Christmas calls us to action in praying over a word and declaring a word either as an individual or as a family heading into the new year with a bold prayer asking God to do something fresh and new in your life I believe God's doing something special here I want to say watch out Virginia Beach because God's up to something God's moving. God's raising up an army. And I love what he's doing. And seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people declare a word and heading out to a new year, whether you're an individual, whether you're a family, I cannot wait to see what God does through you. I'm so excited. Gets me so fired up. And some of you, it's your first time here, you don't have a word. That's fine. You got about 14 minutes. You can write it there. If you don't want to, you can just sit. You, know, you can just be here and take it all in. That's okay. A lot of you friends are joining us online. The sickness is going around. It is. It's real. A lot of you are at home. A lot of you are sick. You can, we have a way for you to do it online. It's okay. People ask, I can't make it. Can I give online? You can give online. If God's calling you to give, you can give online. I want to thank everyone who shared their words. It's been cool to watch and to celebrate and see. And now's a great time. If you haven't done this, let's connect online. My amazing team has created a new Instagram account to help me connect with you better. So if you want to see cute little baby pics, encouragement, just to stay in touch all week long, let's connect. Today is a great time to do that. You can find us on Instagram at pastor.tlane. And thank you for everyone for tagging us and sharing your words with us throughout this season. So let's close here, verse 19. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. That's beautiful, isn't that? One more time. Mary, Mary treasured up all these things. It's a lot to take in. Some of you mamas know you got a baby book. You got a journal. Because if you're not on point, you're going to forget what God's up to when the baby comes. There's a lot going on. She's treasuring up all these things, and she's pondering them. She's processing them. She's saying, what does this mean in her heart? The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. What do you know? God keeps his word. When is he ever not? Now, I told you that I want to give you a new perspective. I want you to see Christmas in a new light in a different way. I'm going to ask a question. What's with the shepherds? Ask your neighbor, what's with the shepherds? Because um, if we can be honest, and it's fair, when we look at the shepherds, a lot of us think, um, and a lot of you have been preached to this, and I think it's true, they're kind of like outcasts. They're kind of on the fringe. Like, when, when, when the angel announces this message, the Messiah is here, the king is here, he didn't go to Caesar. No, no, no. 
didn't go to the high priest. No, no, no. He didn't go to the governor. No, no, no. He went to the lowest of the low, not even in the city, in the outskirts. He went to the shepherds. And that's true. And that's God's style, isn't it? When someone here is like, I don't know if I fit in here. That's the only thing it takes to belong here. If you're like, I'm holy enough, I'm good enough, you ain't going to fit in very good. But if you understand that you are a sinner in needing of God's grace, you're going to fit right in. Right in. Because Jesus was always hanging out with people on the fringe, wasn't he? Is that this? It's like the shepherds are on the fringe. Jesus is just hanging out with people on the fringe. Hanging out with the prostitutes. Hanging out with the lepers. Hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners. Hanging out with them. Sure, he would have hung out with the Dallas Cowboy fans. You know, the people just over there. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. Is that what this is? The shepherds are just out there and they're just kind of those people. Yes and no. There's more to it. There's a lot more to it. Let's go back to the scripture. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. Chapter 35, we first hear of Bethlehem. It's where Jacob's wife, Rachel, was buried. Now the word Rachel means you, or lamb, or sheep. So it's the first mention we hear of it, and it already has this connection to a lamb or a sheep. And you can't know that and look at, okay, there's shepherds in Bethlehem. We can't, like, just ignore that. Okay, something's, something's going on here. Later on, we get to the minor prophet Micah. And in chapter 4, verse 8, he tells us, rather the Holy Spirit tells us through him that basically the Messiah is going to come and be born right here in Bethlehem, right, right in this area. He's coming here. This king, this Messiah, this anointed one, the king is coming, and this is where he's going to be born. Okay? Okay, starting to come together. I want to ask you, what were these shepherds doing? You're like, well, duh, they're raising sheep. This is what shepherds do. It is what they do. Why were they raising sheep? Now, you've had some Greek food. Anybody like Greek food? You're like, they were wanting some gyros. Maybe, maybe more. Scholars will tell us, these shepherds, we can't confirm them, we're pretty sure, but they were probably raising Passover lambs. Passover lambs. What's a Passover lamb? But when a Passover lamb was born, the shepherds, you know what they do? They take it, they'd inspect it, they'd look for blemish, and if it was a male without blemish, you know what they do to that Passover lamb? They wrap it in cloths. And eventually they take it to Jerusalem. Why? Passover. It's a sacrifice. What's Passover? There's a lot here, but in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God's people were slaves to the Egyptians. And God's trying to show us how salvation works. He's trying to teach us the gospel. Friends, the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed than we'd ever believe, yet at the exact same time more loved and accepted in Him than we could ever dare hope. Salvation is not 50-50. Salvation is not you do your best, God will take care of the rest. Salvation is we are fully saved by Him and Him alone. And what they would do at Passover is kind of this crazy idea. This, this lamb would die in your place. A lamb would be killed, a lamb would be sacrificed, and this is even weird, you'd eat it with your family. Isn't that crazy? You sit down with your family, you'd, you'd eat it, you'd take it in, and basically, it died so you could live. Lamb died so you could live. You can put the blood, this is kind of, kind of gross, you put the blood in your doorpost. God's wrath, His, 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 his justice pass over you. The lamb died instead of me. Very simple. Very simple. Why did God choose these shepherds? Is it because they were outcasts? Is it because they were on the fringe? Absolutely. But I believe at Christmas, God gave the shepherds and all of us the ultimate Passover lamb. The ultimate lamb to which every single lamb that would have been sacrificed pointed to. Do you remember what John the Baptist said when he sees Jesus? He says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. I think this is the exact same thing that God's trying to show us. He's here. He's here. 
this lamb is here. He was born in Bethlehem. The shepherds came to look at him, to inspect him, to see him. Two verses after this, you know where Jesus goes? To Jerusalem. To the temple. Because that's what a Passover lamb does. That's what a Passover lamb is. From Jesus' birth to Jesus' death, it points to the Passover. But he was born, the shepherds looked at him, who raised Passover lambs. It's almost as if God is saying, here is the ultimate Passover lamb, I'm giving him to you. But don't miss Jesus' death. Because the last night he was here on earth, did you know what he did with his followers? He could have done anything. He celebrated the Passover. But he kind of made, he kind of put a new, a new spin on it. Because usually at a Passover feast, the lamb was on the table. But at the Last Supper, at, at, at communion, we call it, when Jesus shared this beautiful moment with his followers before he went to the cross, the lamb was not on the table, friends, because the lamb was at the table. It's Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, the true Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He died so you could live. He was laid low so you could be lifted up. His blood was spilled so you could be washed clean. And when he did it, this last supper, the Lord's Supper, we call it, communion, whatever you want to call it, what he did was he wanted them to see what he was about to do. He wanted them to see why he was even born. He took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And you know what he said? This is my body, take and eat. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He next took the cup because he wanted them to see his body wasn't just going to be wasn't just going to be displayed there. His blood was going to be poured out. He took the cup and he poured it out. I gave it to them. He said, "This is this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins." He gave it to them, friends. He said, "Do this in remembrance of me." He wants us to see and hear and touch and smell that God saves you through radical grace. Radical grace. And if that lamb wasn't dying, it would be me and you who would be dying. Because friends, our sin, we deserve to be separated from God. Each and every one of us. And if you're in Christ, Jesus took that penalty for you. So you can be free. The next time you see a manger, it could be a lit up one, it could be an inflatable one, it could be one on the tree. The next time you see a manger, I hope some part of you feels that's cozy, that's cute, it's nostalgic, it's Christmas, but I hope your heart also says this Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the Don't forget he was born in Bethlehem. Don't forget he was inspected by shepherds. Don't forget he was born in a a manger, which is what, for animals? Don't forget he was wrapped in cloths just like a lamb would have been. Don't forget what God has done in your life. And don't forget what God wants to do in this city and this world. In just a moment, we're going to go to a time of prayer. And the band will come back up. When I say amen, the band will jump back in. And if you feel led, if you feel called, you can bring your envelope forward. You can have three and a half minutes to write your word down if you'd like to. If you don't, it's okay. It's okay. It's between you and him. In three and a half minutes, what we're going to do, when the band starts, when I say amen, you're going to come forward. You can put your envelope here if you have a word. You can lay down a gift if you'd like. You don't have to. You can make a commitment on that envelope for giving next year if you'd like, if you feel led to. And what we challenge you here at St. Church, if you don't give here, give somewhere. Give to something. Let God work through you. Because you're not actually giving to a St. Church, you're giving through a St. Church to bless the city and this world. Remember, you're going to come to these center aisles, you're going to come forward, you're going to lay it down, then you're going to walk to the walls, you're going to receive communion. 
If you're a Christian, if you feel called today, now maybe you're, you're not sure what this means, I'm going to ask you to wait and hold off. Or maybe you don't feel led to receive communion today. It's okay. It's okay. But if so, receive it with an open hand and go back to your seat. Don't eat it and drink it here. Just go back to your seat and just hold it. Reflect on who Jesus is and why he came. After that song, I'll come back up here and we'll receive the Lord's Supper together. Throughout this moment, while you're coming forward, here's what I want you to be thinking about. I want you to be appreciating the past and anticipating the future. I want you to appreciate all that God has done in your life this year, in your family this year, in this city this year, every salvation every baptism, every child who's learning about God, every teenager, every single thing he's done, I want you to take some time and worship him and thank him. And then with a boldness, with an expectancy, I want you to ask him to do something bigger in your life. Not for your benefit, not for your comfort, but so that he can be a blessing in you and through you. Would you pray with me?